Well, good evening and welcome to Grange Baptist Church. And we pray that the Lord will bless us even as we meet together in this gospel meeting. And we're going to just open our time with a word of prayer. And then once again, some worship has been prepared for us. And we pray that the Lord will bless us even as we sing his praise together. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we praise thee and we thank thee for every blessing that thou hast granted to us already this day. We thank you, Father, even for that measure of health and strength that even finds us once again in this evening hour. And we pray, Father, that thou wouldst bless us even as we come together. And we pray that thou wouldst accept the praise of our lips and the worship of our hearts. And we pray that as we rejoice even in the good news of the gospel once again, that thou wouldst bless thy word even to each and to every hearer. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst take that dealing within all of our hearts. And we pray that as we hear the word of truth, that it would truly reveal to us even the great message of love in the gospel. We pray, Father, that there would be that opportunity even granted to those who are outside of thee, even to come to that saving knowledge as the Spirit strives within and confirms and applies even the Word of God to their hearts. We're thankful, Father, that that door is still open, that there is available to all who will believe a full and free salvation only to be found in Jesus Christ. And so we come and ask even for that to be a reality in our lives and in our hearts this day. We pray, Father, that thou would bless us, that thou would grant to us even in these moments together, even a sense of thy Spirit amongst us. And we pray that as we sing the hymns, and as we hear from thy word, that the, the Spirit of God would evidently move and evidently work. Not only for ourselves, but right around our land tonight. We pray for the proclamation of the gospel. We pray for the preaching of the truth. We pray that those who hear and might receive, and there would be that great harvest of souls, we pray. We may pray, be even that great rejoicing in heaven over sinners who find a salvation in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. Hear us and answer us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace.
call of the kingdoms. Lift your eyes to the King. Let His song rise within you as a fragrant offering of how God, rich in mercy, came in Christ to redeem all who trust in His unfailing grace. Hear the call of the kingdom to be children of light with the mercy of heaven the humility of christ walking justly before him loving all that is right that the life of christ may shine through us king of heaven we will answer the call we will follow out to the lost with the 
coming to the Word of God tonight, we want to, of course, note our thanks to those who are continuing to be involved in the preparation of our praise service by service, and indeed to those involved in the recording of our services, and we want to record that note of thanks and appreciation. I know it's appreciated by you there at home, and we just want to know that those involved also know of our appreciation to them. And so we're turning this evening to Revelation in the chapter 10, Revelation in the chapter 10, and we're going to read together this little chapter that's contained here in the middle of this great book. Revelation in the chapter 10, let's read together from the verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things which are therein, and that they should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sign, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hands and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter." And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and, tongue, and nations and tongues and kings. Amen. And may the Lord bless even the reading of his word afresh to our hearts tonight. Now as we come to consider this 10th chapter, we see here uh, something that happens immediately after, of course, the sixth trumpet has sounded and we know that the woes have begun there upon the earth. The Bible records for us here, as John beholds, he says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, coming to consider this angel tonight, we acknowledge, of course, that amongst the commentators there is some disagreement as to who this angel may be. There are some who have suggested that it is the Lord Jesus Christ. They, get that, they gain that, of course, from the acknowledgement that he was clothed with a cloud, a rainbow was upon his head, his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. There are others, of course, who suggest as well that this is rather simply a mighty angel sent from God. That is a view that I would support for what it's worth. I would support it simply because during the days of tribulation, the Lord Jesus Christ is he who is present in heaven there with the church has redeemed his own at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I believe that the Lord will not return to earth again, will not bodily touch down upon the earth until the day of his great appearing just as we looked at in the book of Titus a number of Sundays ago. And so John here records the appearance of this mighty angel, and regardless of the view, whether you take it to be the Lord Jesus Christ, or whether you take it to be simply that of a mighty angel sent from God, it is that appearance that indeed uh, captures the attention of John as he writes this chapter. And this appearance is nonetheless taken up and wrapped up in the understanding that he who came, came with all the authority of heaven. For as he stands upon the earth, it tells us that he is one foot upon the earth and he is one foot in the sea. That, of course, reminding us of the great fact that the earth is the footstool of God and the heavens are the work of his hands. He is in control of the seas, just as the wind and waves obeyed him there in the days when he spent on earth with his disciples and the storm came as they were in the boat together and even the wind and seas obeyed him was the testimony of the disciples. So too we see here a reminder that our God is one who controls the earth, one who controls the very movement of his seas 
I believe that to be a testimony of the power that is invested in and indeed granted to this angel as he comes to the earth. During the days, remember, of the great tribulation, those last three and a half years, whenever even the judgments of God are at their most severe and the sufferings of man are at their height. Coming into the world then, he hurls forth a message which is accompanied, the Bible tells us here, by the sound of seven mighty thunderings. He says he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, the truth about the lion uttering and the roaring there is, of course, symbolic of what we read in Revelation chapter 5, that of the Lamb. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And so this is a message from the victor. This is, the message, this is a message, I believe, from the one who is going very soon to touch down upon earth. And truly every knee shall bow before him. Every tongue shall confess. But also uh, the significance of a lion is seen, is it not, in our understanding of what a lion is and who, uh, what power a lion has. For as a, if a lion roared around us, we would immediately sit up and take notice. We'd be looking around us, ensuring that the lion wasn't too near to us, that there was a way of escape, that we could get away if he, he threatened us or if he uh, seemed to be in the mood to cause us any harm. And therefore, not only is the lion symbolic of the great power that the lamb possesses, and this angel then is given to him the message to proclaim on earth, a message from the coming victor and indeed the coming judge of all the unsaved, but it's also symbolic of that which is a message that people will take note of. They will hear and their ears will be attuned to it. It will be out of the ordinary. And these seven great thunderings that accompany it will also allow the earth to know that moment whenever their attention is wrapped and indeed fixed upon the message that this angel is proclaiming. And what is that message? The Bible tells us when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. This is John is saying that as this message goes forth and as he's beholding all that shall happen here in these latter days upon earth, he's about to write that which was uttered. But look at what he's told. He heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, verse 4, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Now again, there's some disagreement as to whether or not that is simply uh, uh, the fact that perhaps Satan responds and uh, the, God gives John the instruction that what Satan says is not worth recording. It's not worthy of a mention in Scripture. I don't really ascribe to that view. Rather, I do subscribe to the view that uh, the fact that these things are not uttered, or, not, or they were uttered but not recorded, is simply because the half has not yet been told. God's final dealings with mankind are a mystery that we have yet to uh, to know and to be revealed unto us. But there is coming that day that the inhabitants upon this earth who are upon this earth at the moment of these la latter day dealings of God upon this earth, they will hear these things and it will be revealed to them exactly what God has planned for the end of the ages. That's simply the view that I hold about all of this because I believe that there is much that we could give our minds to, but Scripture is silent upon uh, much of the detail of the last days. And therefore, it fits very neatly into that understanding that God has given us exactly what we need to be aware of in this times, And that the, the reasons for giving us that we'll, we'll come to in just a few moments. But nevertheless, those things which are not to be uh, discussed and not uh, indeed to be engaged in uh, are, are thinking about and we're not to give ourselves even to pontificating about, those, are, those belong to God. Scripture is silent on them. And as John was begin, beginning to write such a mystery, John was beginning to write such things, God forbade him and said, No, hold thy pen. That will be revealed in the time yet to come, that day that is appointed by me. The Bible says, Nevertheless, that the angel which I saw upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that, are, that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that, they should be, that there should be time no longer. And so here is the message that is recorded. And it's a message that really holds no surprise to us, does it? It is a message that tells the world that the end is nigh. It's telling them, of course, that the climax of the fury and the wrath of God, the days will be known. And indeed, them, the days of the climax of his wrath and his fury, they're coming. They're coming very soon. These are the times whenever the days shall be shortened. There'll be no more delay. Remember the six trumpet woes. 
or the six trumpets have sounded, the woes have commenced, and so the angel comes and delivers a message that is predictable, but also poignant. For this is ushering in the very end of the world as we know it. This is ushering in the very appointed time of God whenever Christ shall return, whenever the enemies shall be made the footstool, and whenever that a thousand year reign of Christ here on earth shall begin. And then at the end of it all, of course, there'll be that releasing of Satan once again, the great battle that will be known upon those days, and then the casting into the eternal pit of damnation, Satan, all his followers, and all unbelievers for everlasting judgment. And this earth will be wrapped up like a vesture, set to one side, and the new heavens and the new earth shall be ushered in. And this is the message that the angel is heralding. This is the one that is recorded. The time shall be no more. That is, there'll be no more centuries. There'll be no more decades. There'll be no more... Uh, days of history to record. Why? Because the end is nigh. The end is nigh. This is a fulfillment of all that the prophets spoke of. It's that long expected day of the Lord. It'll see the fulfillment of the promises to Abraham. It'll see the fulfillment of the promises to David. It'll see the fulfillment to the, of the promises to Israel. And they'll all be literally fulfilled. And as the song says, Christ is coming. So that takes on a whole new level of significance on this day. The battle of Armageddon surely is imminent at this time. The regathering of Israel shall occur. The fleeing of the children of God from the city of Jerusalem to that place of sanctuary and safety through a valley that he shall cleave as he touches down with his feet upon the Mount of Olives. That is all ahead. And this angel is hurling forth that news. The time is now come. Jesus shall soon appear. The Bible tells us in verse 8, the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel. Now if you come back, of course, uh, to the beginning there where it tells us that there came down and a mighty angel came down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was at where the sun and his feet were as pillars of fire and he had in his hand a little book open. And here John is now exhorted by the voice from heaven, that's the voice of God, to go and to take that little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Now he has to give it. The angel gives it to John to eat. Now this little book is distinct from the other books mentioned already in Revelation. For this book is one which of course is not sealed, or not on sale like we saw it there, but rather it's opened. It's opened. It's in the hand of the angel. And it's small enough for John to read. Now, what is this book? I believe that this book is simply the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we come to consider that for just a few moments, I wanted to explain to you why I believe that to be so. The Bible goes on to say, I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And so as I come to understand what this little book is all about, I truly believe that it is a gospel of Jesus Christ. And as John here is uh, exhorted by the voice from heaven, the voice of God, to go to the angel and to receive it, and as the angel extends a hand and offers it to John, and John partakes of it, the angel warns him, this book will be sweet to your taste, but it will be bitter in your belly. And all of this is done so that you can go forth and you can prophesy to nations, to tongues, to peoples, and to kings. See, John here is spending his time with God on the Isle of Patmos. And this was an important time. This was a time whenever God was giving to him this revelation of Jesus Christ, this revelation not of what will happen at the end of times because this is not the emphasis of this book. Oh yes, there are many messages about the end times that are contained in this book and we have noted them and we have, beginning, and we have spent time in them and we will continue to spend time in them. But the emphasis of this book is the revelation of Jesus Christ, that which ushers in the grand appearing of Jesus Christ to this earth once again. 
And that which ushers in for you and I as believers, if we are saved in Christ tonight, that acknowledgement and that truth that we rule and reign with him here on earth. And that begins all of eternity when from this time we are translated into the eternal state and forever we know the presence of our Savior. Does it not warn the unbeliever also of the coming judge? The revelation of Jesus Christ to them is all about the one who one day will touch down upon earth once again to judge them, to cast them into that place of everlasting damnation. Why? Because they've rejected the message of the revelation. They've rejected the person of the revelation. And they've rejected the the offer of grace and mercy of the revelation. But here this angel reveals to John that this is given to him so that he can go forth and he can stand, he can preach, and he can teach once again to peoples, to nations, to tongues, and to kings. Why? Because whilst this book is important, and whilst the message of this book is important, this book and the apocalyptic events that it uh, tells of, that was not to be the central thrust of his message. It's very much part of his message, and no doubt an important part. But he was to use the experience that God gave him there on the Isle of Patmos, and the truth of the message given to him as motivation of even greater gospel work. To go forth and to reach the peoples, the nations, the tongues and the kings. To go and fulfill that great commission that Christ gave to the church. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And that's why I believe this book was sweet. Because there's no greater work to be involved in than to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. There's no greater message to proclaim than to go forth and to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. There's no sweeter moment than to see that message taking effect in the life of a sinner. There's no sweeter moment than seeing and hearing a sinner cry for forgiveness unto Christ. But there's a bitter side to it also. The sweet side is experienced as we come to receive for ourselves the gospel, as we then go forth and minister the gospel. And that is my sweet experience tonight, to come and to afresh preach the unsearchable riches of Christ, to preach afresh this gospel message that you, if you come to him, might find forgiveness, might know redemption, might be assured of a home in heaven. But oh, there's a better taste. There's a better taste to the gospel. And surely that's experienced in the times whenever the Spirit of God is evidently speaking to a soul, evidently moving in the heart of one and simply they shrug it off. They get up from their seat. They leave a building such as this and they do not accept the offer of forgiveness. There's no more better experience than to hear someone say, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And oh preacher, I know that I will get, I need to get saved and I assent with my head the fact that Christ is Savior, but I'm not willing to bow the knee. I'm not willing to confess my sin. I'm not willing to enter in and accept of Jesus Christ as my Savior. Oh yes, I know, but I'm not willing to do. No many better experiences are known. Whenever those sad words are said, almost thou persuadest me. Oh yes, I know I need Christ. I know, yes, preacher, someday I'll get saved. But not tonight. I know the pain that is experienced when someone you have preached to, someone you have witnessed to, someone you have pleaded with passes from this life into a Christless eternity. All because they refuse to personally accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Lost and damned forever. That's a bitter taste. And that's why I believe with all of my heart here that John is receiving this message of the gospel afresh to his heart because he was not to be consumed with the apocalyptic events and he was not to be consumed with a message about end times that was to be part of his message, but he was to go forth and to stand before men. He was to stand before women and he was to cry unto them and he was to plead with them for their soul salvation. I know that tonight that you too would hear. 
hear words whereby you might be saved. And I wonder tonight as you hear, what will you do with Christ? Last week we noted, of course, that the days of which John records are days of judgment. They speak forward to the days of final and absolute judgment that will be known upon earth and in the life of every sinner. But oh, that you would heed his invitation because today is a day that is full of grace. It's a, the days of judgment are fast approaching. But today this is a day of mercy. And this is a day whenever his voice is calling you. And today if you hear his voice, Harden not your heart. John records our Lord as a coming judge to the unbeliever. The coming victor for the believer. But remember how we looked last week at the writings of John. And in John's gospel, he also penned those great words of love. Those great words that God so loved the world that he gave. And that's the message we wish to focus on tonight as we end. It's not the apocalyptic events that shall unfold as God judges this world, as God judges the sinner. It motivates us. There's no doubt about that. But the message that we focus on and the message that we finish with tonight is a message of love. It's a message of compassion. It's a message to be found in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there's judgment ahead for the sinner, but there's a Savior to be found tonight. I know that you would find that Savior. In the gospel records, we're told of how Christ lived here on earth. They record how that he came and he fed the thousands who followed him. A new hunger and thirst and he broke that bread and he provided to them exactly what they needed. They record the fact that he so tenderly touched the eyes of the blind, giving sight to those who had never saw. They record how that he made the deaf to hear, he made the dumb to talk. They record how that he cast out the demons from the possessed. He gave peace of heart and of mind to the troubled. They tell how that he raised the widow of Nain's son to life once again. How he called his very own friend Lazarus forth from the tomb. And how he brought life to Jairus' daughter once again. They tell how he lovingly and tenderly took the children upon his knee and blessed them. They tell how that with patience and love he instructed his disciples, despite their feelings, despite their weaknesses. They tell how he bowed on his knees in the garden. And there, as he knew those last moments of freedom, he prayed that the gospel work that he would go to do and the gospel work that he would finish would find a resting place in the hearts of people just like you people just like me. They tell how that in those moments that followed that prayer that he even healed the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. Despite the fact that Malchus would treat him cruelly and was involved in the mob that sought his death. After Peter sliced his ear off, he reached forth and put it back tenderly together. They tell how that Christ answered the questions of Caiaphas and of Pilate with decorum. They tell how that despite being beaten at the hands of men, having his beard plucked from his face, having his back whipped with a leather whip of nine tails, exposed to the bones of his back, but still he said nothing. They tell how that he allowed the crown of thorns to be thrust on his head and then to be paraded naked before the mocking soldiers. They tell how that he took upon his now tired and broken body a cross that was made out of wood from a tree that he had created. And he took that cross and walked up a hill as the mocking crowd laughed, scorned and spat upon him. They tell how that upon that hill he put down that cross. There upon that cross he voluntarily laid himself upon. No man forced him. 
he willingly gave his life. They tell how that without a second thought, his hands were driven through with nails, ensuring that he was fixed to that cross all the while there he was looking into the very eyes of the man who drove those nails through his hands with love and compassion. They tell how that that cross was thrown into a hole in the ground and it knocked every bone out of joint. They tell how that despite all of this and many other things beside, that as he hung and as he suffered upon that cross, his message was one of love. It was one of pity. It was one of compassion. It was one of mercy. And it was one of his invitation. For there upon that cross, as he surveyed the crowd that was gathered around him, as he looked into their faces, and as he saw the generations of men and women to come, as he saw you, as he saw me, his hands were extended and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They tell how that with one final ounce of strength in his body, he bowed his head and he cried, It is finished. They tell how that he gave his life for you. How that he gave his life for me. No, tonight, sinner, you're outside of Christ. You know nothing of what it means to be saved. You know nothing of what it means to accept for yourself the offer of mercy and grace in this gospel, this sweet taste of all that Christ has done for you. Will you come? Will you come to the one who died with arms outstretched and a loving invitation to come unto Him that you might know forgiveness from all your sin and that you might have assurance of a home in heaven. Tonight, don't look at the Savior in pity, but look at Him and see in Him the answer to your greatest need. Look at him and see in him the greatest invitation that you could ever receive and that you could ever accept. Come. Come to him tonight. The hymn writer put it this way, Come to the Savior. Make no delay. Here in his word he has shown us the way. Here in our midst he's standing today. And he's tenderly saying, come. I know that the voice of God has been speaking to you. Perhaps it's true in your life that he's been speaking to you for several weeks. I wonder tonight, will you come? Will you come and accept of the salvation that he alone can give? Will you come? and accept the sweetness of the gospel. Tonight, I plead with you, come. I urge you to come. Come to Christ tonight. Father, we thank and we praise thee. For the truth of thy word which reminds us not only that judgment is coming but of the blessed truth that salvation is available to them that will believe. And so Father we pray that tonight that thou would be pleased to allow that message of hope that message of truth that message of love to find a resting place in the hearts and lives of many who listen. We pray that there would be that great and gathering of souls. We pray, our Father, that truly the work of God will be accomplished in the hearts and lives of all those who hear. Strive on, O Spirit of God, and give deciding grace and give no peace and no rest 
to that one who remains outside of thee, who so stubbornly has resisted thy urge to come. Oh, Father, work. Break down that stubborn well. May one and all be sure tonight that they are ready for heaven. They are ready for home. Go before us in this week as it lies before us. And we pray for the divine protection of God to be known. We pray for the manifestation of the work of God to be seen. And we pray that each of us might know even the blessing upon our, of God upon our lives and our homes and our families. And we'll praise thee and we'll thank thee for it. In Jesus' name. Amen.